beginning at verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, than man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant does not know what his Lord is doing. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. And whatever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you that you love one another. Just that far. Scripture from John 15, beginning at verse 9. The Lord Jesus said, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, than man lay down his life for his friend. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant does not know what his Lord is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you, that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. And whatever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that you love one another. I want to begin with a question. What's prayer? What is prayer to you? To many people, it's it's getting stuff or getting information or strictly for emergency. I know a Christian couple, they're in business. They were in business before the business went bankrupt. They're in business again. I think it's going to happen again. And when there's a danger of this happening, they phone all their friends to pray for them, to pray for the business, you know. And in between, I don't know if they do any praying at all. I really don't know. But for some people, it's strictly for emergency. I'll give you two extreme positions uh, taken from some reading. One fellow said, a prayer doesn't really get anything from God because this God stuff is pretty, you know, shadowy, but it's a good thing, it's like spiritual PT, it's good for the soul to pray, you know. Another fellow in a book on prayer said, and this is extreme too, he said, prayer is backing a three-ton truck up to the warehouse of heaven and then driving away with a full load. So that was prayer to him. What is prayer? Prayer should be, first of all, fellowship with God fellowship with God. You are my friends 
We're not servants, we're friends. We're servants too, but friends first of all, as we note in the scripture here. Well, let's take off on that. Three times Abraham was called the friend of God. Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, heard a big army had come into his land. He called a prayer meeting. I think it was the biggest prayer meeting in history because the whole nation was there. All of Judah was there, and Benjamin, I imagine, too, because the two tribes were very closely related. Men, women, children, thousands. And he's praying. And he reminded God in his prayer that they were the seed of Abraham, your friend. That's how he put it. He didn't say who Abraham long ago was was your friend. He spoke as if Abraham was still on friendly terms with God, you know. Then in Isaiah 41, 8, God addressed Jacob or Israel as being the seed of Abraham, my friend. Not Abraham who used to be long ago, my friend. And then James in James chapter 2, he said about Abraham, he was called the friend of God. Jesus said in Matthew 22, I believe it is, he reminded them of the scripture in Exodus chapter 3, where God said, I am, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he said, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. For all live unto him. So what he was saying was, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are alive and well and fellowshipping with God on the other side. That's what he was really saying there. Abraham, the friend of God. Now Moses' father-in-law had four or five different names. One named Ruel or Raguel meant the friend of God. I don't know where he got the name from, I guess his parents, but why he got this name, I don't really know. He's a very powerful personality, and yet very little said about it. You remember he gave good advice to Moses? He saw Moses going to kill himself with all the counseling he was doing, and gave him some better advice. He was called a priest of God, so he knew things about God, and I think he passed some of this on to Moses. We don't know what the connection is here, because not a great deal to say we we'll read about him rejoicing before God and eating with Moses and the elders of Israel before the Lord and all this stuff, you know. He was a great guy. He was, he was a friend of God, you know. And that's important to know. It said of Moses that God spoke with Moses face to face as a man speaks to a friend. And um, his sister Miriam and his brother Aaron, Aaron was a very weak character, Anybody could lead him in any direction they wanted, and sometimes they did. And she led him in this. And they decided to challenge Moses' authority. And it went something like this. Hey, Moses, God hasn't spoken only by you, you know. He's spoken by us as well. But the, 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 the scripture says, the account says that they did this because he'd married a black woman, an Ethiopian woman. And they, they didn't like that, see. So I guess the boy was black. And God suddenly spoke and said, I'll come out, you three. And I can just see Miriam bumping Aaron and winking at him, hey, Moses is going to find out now what's going on around here. You know. So the three then stood up. And then God said, uh, Miriam and Aaron, step forward. Oh, Moses is staying behind, see. They felt real good until God spoke. And here's basically what he said. If I speak to a prophet, I speak to visions or dreams. But my servant Moses is not so. With him I speak face to face. Why then were you not afraid, you know, to say what you say? And um, Miriam was smitten with leprosy. Why wasn't Aaron smitten with leprosy? I wondered about that. I think the problem is, I mentioned a few moments ago, Aaron was a very weak character. 
when Israel wanted, you know, God they could see, Aaron didn't take a stand, he went along with it, you know. He kind of get God into it somehow, but he went along with it, you know. He's a very, he was the old, he was two years older than Moses, and he was a far better public speaker than Moses was, but God didn't choose him to be the leader because he didn't have it. He couldn't be trusted in some ways. And so I think God gave her the leprosy because she led him into this. It couldn't be for any other reason that God would prefer a male over a female, you know. In any case, God said, like she was smitten with leprosy, and Aaron cried about this to Moses, and Moses cried to God, and God said, if her father had spit in her face, she'd have to spend seven days outside the camp. So stick her outside the camp seven days, which was God's way of saying, Miriam, I just spit in your face. Don't you ever challenge Moses again. So Moses and God, you know, at one occasion they spent 80 days together. On 40 days and the second occasion for another 40 days. 40 days. Never ate, never drank. Just communing. Isn't that amazing? You know? Well, some people, you know, the meeting gets to be 40 minutes long as they want to go home. And sometimes they do, you know. They get enough of God in 30 minutes or even less. And sometimes when it comes to a daily devotional, you know, when I went to Saskatoon in 1962, we had 175 members of the church, and we were running close to 300 Sunday mornings, and um, there were a lot of people who had been Bible school graduates and stuff, you know, and um, I wanted to find out where these people were really at. So one Sunday morning, I passed off papers, and the people were told, now don't sign your name. So everybody was honest in answering the questions. I had questions like, how much time a day do you spend uh, with the Bible, you know? How much time a day do you spend in prayer? Uh, have you ever witnessed to sinners? Have you ever led a sinner to Christ? Do you tie your income? And I could hardly wait to get these papers until I got them, and I wish I'd never done it, you know. I couldn't believe it. You know, the average person was about five minutes a day they were giving God, you know. One guy put down 30 minutes for, for um, devotional time, and then his conscience went and he scratched it off and put a big zero there. He wasn't funny any time. And I, I got those papers that I have to confess I balls, you know. I just cried. I couldn't believe it. Hardly anybody had witnessed anybody. Hardly anybody had ever wanted to go the Lord. And, and many of them were not tithing. And they were a good evangelical church, right? And so I began to pray for revival. What else can you do? You know. We had teens come. We had one guy come, he and his wife, and uh, he was highly tutored as an evangelist. I think he was a good, a good guy and all of that. But the thing they advertised about him was that when he uh, played in, in uh, nightclubs, he used to stand on his hands and tap dance on, on a board above his feet here, you know. And that was his claim to fame, you know. And uh, we had guys come, we had one fellow come, he would train a volunteer choir every night. We'd have 40 people singing in a choir every night, and, and he could play this instrument, that instrument, you know. I mean, we tried a lot of stuff, just garbage, you know. And nothing happened. So they come, and one or two people get revived, maybe, and, and some people start diving, and three people would ask to join the church, and then it was all over, you know. And I gave up on that. I told God, God, I'm not going this way anymore. This is garbage, you know. We're just not going this way anymore. And I shared my burden with, with a missionary. He said, why don't you contact Ralph and Lucy Terrence? I said, who are they? And they told me about my doctor address. I wrote them. They couldn't come for two years. But I, I learned more about them. They had a deep, a powerful, revival-type ministry. And uh, then we prayed. And all we did was pray. We got, we got, our prayer meeting went from 25 to 150, 175. And uh, every Sunday evening, we spent a half hour in prayer at the conclusion of the service just to pray for revival for those who wanted to stay. We had 40, 50 people stay for that time of prayer for revival. We had a prayer wheel in the bulletin board in the foyer, and people could sign their name in 15-minute prayer slots. Uh, and so pretty soon we had the whole 24 hours taken up, which meant that any time of the day and night, someone from our church was underneath praying for revival. We tried cottage prayer meetings. We tried everything we could. And we didn't do it all at once. We did it over a period of time, you see. And, um, and I, I, at one point, I finally asked, asked 
to the people, ask God to waken you through the night just to get up and pray for revival. And God began doing that. And people began to tell me things like this. You know, I used to be prayed out in five minutes. I prayed last night about two o'clock in the morning. I must have prayed for an hour. I could have prayed for two hours. Mm -hmm. Because God was responding. Listen carefully. In the book of Zechariah, it says that God poured upon his people the spirit of grace and supplication. That's the spirit of prayer. One translation says the spirit of grace to supplicate, to pray. Finney made much of the spirit of prayer. He had two men, Abel Clary and Father Nash, when he was going somewhere for meetings, he sent them ahead two weeks ahead, perhaps, or ten days. These guys would pray eight and ten hours a day. Then he said, when I got there, the revival had already started. We don't do anything like that today. We don't know how to do it today. We don't think it works today. It doesn't work because it doesn't work. That's the problem. So Moses was a man of God. Eighty days alone with God. How could he do it? You know, in North America, if we're so far behind Christians in some other country, we don't even know. We can't even see them with telescopes, you know. They're so far ahead. I've been in a lot of countries around the world. And I've met people, you know. Maybe all they had was a mud floor in their shack, you know. And everybody lived in one big room and had a hole in the ceiling let the smoke go out. So, you know, it was right when there was a fire inside, but that was life. But it was God. He gave maybe two tenths of their income to God and all this sort of thing, witnessing to their neighbors and all this, you know. We're so far behind, we don't even know it. And we've lost contact with God. You know. We're not really friends to God. I read this shortly after I became a Christian. If God could have a need, it could only be a need for fellowship. Why did he make us in his image and likeness? So we could communicate. It must be that. It can't be anything else. And people have often in constant say, you know, I pray on God doesn't say anything. Thank you, Lord. Could I ask you to move over and I could get any extra chair though? David was called a man after God's own heart. And I made a study of David and his prayer life. It's very interesting to see how much time. Psalm 88, 1. He said, day and night, I have cried before you. I prevented the dawning of the morning and cried, which means he got up before the sun was up and prayed. Seven times a day do I praise thee because of your righteous judgment. And many verses of this kind in the Psalms, showing that David spent a great deal of time in prayer. And if you notice his life, uh, when he faced an emergency, he always prayed. He always called on God for guidance. And he always got guidance from God, too. We know that. But David, a man after God's own heart, I'm sure we could call him a friend of God. Have you ever thought of yourself as a friend of God? What kind of time do you give him? If we gave an earthly friend the little time we give God, we wouldn't have any friends, right? You know? We tip our hat to God every now and then, and if we get into trouble, then we can pray really loud and long, and then when it's all over. There's a verse in the Bible that says, I'm going to have to paraphrase it, it goes like this. The things you promised God when you were in trouble, you better come across, you know. So we get in trouble when we promises to God when it's all over, we forget about it. When I was just a kid, I got in trouble with the police, and I had been collecting shells, and another young kid had been collecting, or his father had been collecting guns, and we got together one day. An old, sharp buckle of gun, a single shot thing, and I had a shell that fit it, and we put it in, and it went off. It was an old gun scene, it slipped, and it went off, and there was a little kid standing in front at the time. 
He wasn't killed. He wasn't even hurt badly. Just It just took a little skin off of one of his legs. But it wasn't long until the police were there. And I promised God the moon with a green fence around it. He just kept me off the hook, you know. <laughs> and he did, and I promptly forgot all about it, you know. It was much years later, I was 22 before I got saved, but I made promises to God, and oh man, I can remember that so well. It didn't mean anything. Friend of God, David. Jack Hiles in Hammond, Indiana, some of you don't know who he is, and some of you don't, he's dead now. He had a small church in, I think it was Garland, Texas. They had about 60 members, and he was never, he just wasn't getting anywhere. So was never got saved. And he didn't know why. His father was an alcoholic, and one day his father died, and this brought things to a climax in his thinking. After the funeral, the funeral, the cemetery was in a secluded place. He went to his daddy's grave. He threw himself across his father's grave. And this is a prayer he prayed. God, I won't eat, and I won't drink, and I'll die if I have to, but I will not move from this place until you give me power to preach the gospel. Mm. He lay there three days and three nights. All he ever said was, God touched me. He went back to his little church, and the first time he preached, 18 people were saved. And in about four years, that church went from 60 to 2,000 members. Then he moved to Hammond, Indiana. The church had 800 members, and... Um, he lost several hundred because of his method of soul winning. When he first got there, Gordon Bailey and I were there for a visit one time. They had 95,000 members in the church, and they were baptizing 200 converts a week on the average. But he said this, Whenever I sense the power is gone, I fast and I pray. And I get other people to fast and to pray until God touches us again. He takes that verse in the Psalms, the, the verse he uses, for this kind of activity, I shall be anointed with fresh oil. And he said, we need to be anointed with fresh oil again and again. Mm -hmm. And um, well, we have to give God quality time. Mm -hmm. And it's not always easy, especially in some situations. But somehow we have to do it. To be alone with God. Let him speak. I know we're afraid to do that sometimes because of what he might say. That shouldn't be a problem. When Daniel knew the writing was signed and that anybody who prayed to any god or man except to the, to the king would be thrown into the den of lions, when he knew the writing was signed, he did what he always did. He prayed three times a day. Three times a day. Spurgeon said, I rarely pray for a half an hour, an hour at a time. But he said, when I wake in the morning, before my feet hit the floor, I'm talking to my Lord. He says, and then I find myself talking to Jesus all day long. Mm -hmm. And you know, just when he was dying, he said to Susanna's wife, Susanna, I've had such a wonderful time with you. Then he was gone. It's such a wonderful time with Jesus. And that's what it's all about, you know. A, a servant doesn't know what his Lord is doing, but a friend, Jesus said, all things I've heard of my Father I've made known unto you. I read an African publication, and here, here was a story. A young fellow got saved, and he'd been at one of the Christian schools, and he got saved. Shortly after, he went to the missionaries and said, God has called me to be a pastor, give me a church. Well, they had a little meeting. Oh, come on, come on. This kid doesn't know anything, you know. How come he's in the church? We'll put him up. We'll tell him to come back in six months, and he'll forget about it. So they did. But in six months, he came back. Where's the church? They'd forgotten about it in the meantime. So they put him on for another three months, and he came back again. And here's what these rascally missionaries finally did. They had a church. And the way they put it was, it could have written its own history of the wars of the Lord because it had been fighting for years, you know. They had nothing less but about a dozen people. Now, we'll give them this church, and we won't tell them about its past history. There's no way he can, he can save it, and it'll go down, and then we'll have to tell them, well, son, you weren't really called to be a pastor. So it happened. 
At the time I read the article, he was still a pastor of the church and I had 5,000 members. What had happened? Every now and then, here's what he would say to the church, God is calling me away. I, I don't know what else is that. I may be gone for two weeks or three weeks. I found a cave in the hills. And I'll take a sack of corn and there's a creek not far away and so I'll drink from the creek and I'll eat my food and I'll pray and I'll fast. You know, if a preacher did that in North America, they'd fire him, right? They see this guy. Who does he think he's going away for two weeks? Fishing? Golfing was, you know? We kicked him out. They didn't kick him out. Every time he came back from that cave, there was a new revival. And sometimes hundreds of people are saved, you know. We don't, in North America, we don't know anything about this. You know, Finney used to rise at four every morning and read the Bible and pray till eight every day. So did Moody. So did Tory. So did many praying hide in India. Spent ten hours a day in prayer on the average. When the, when the bell rang for dinner, he would say, Jesus, do I go or do I stay? And I don't know who would ask him to stay, so he stayed. When I was in India, they wanted to take me over to where Praying High had ministered, and we couldn't go because of the, the program we had. I couldn't go. I wish I had somehow managed to go. Because although he'd been there a long while, they still talked about it. Pray God in the wonderful ministry he had. He asked God to give him a soul today. Then he asked God to give him two souls today. Then he asked God to give him three souls a day. I think he got up to five souls a day. He would never go to bed at night until that fifth soul was one to Christ. You know. Well, we don't know anything about that in North America. We've got a slap happy kind of Christianity, you know. We want God to be in it somehow, but not too much because he might make some demands we don't want to have anything to do with. And it's, it's a sad situation. I don't really have a text that we're talking about being a friend to God. John the Baptist said this, He that has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears the bridegroom's voice rejoices greatly because the bridegroom, bridegroom's voice this my joy therefore is fulfilled what he was saying was John the Baptist I'm a friend to Jesus he saw that we don't know much about him he trained for 30 years for 6 months ministry and then lost his head it doesn't sound like a success story but it certainly was a success story we have no idea what time he spent with God I imagine he spent hours every day alone with God Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. That's not how it is in North America. It's, Lord, you better listen, for I'm speaking. You know. It's the other way around, and it shouldn't be. Calling on God. Talking with God. Listening to God. You know, when you read the Bible, God is speaking to you. Do you ever think of it that way? Or you just read it, so you've got to you got to trigger it up. I'm going to read a chapter a day, so you read a chapter a day. If somebody asked you later on in the day which chapter you read, you can't remember it. You know. It didn't make a dent because you really, were really not into it. And to be alone with God and forget about time. Do what you have to do in order to do that. To be that. But we are beholding as in the glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So we want to be transformed into the image of Christ. How do we do that? We do that by looking at Christ in the pages of Scripture and asking God to speak. Don't ever read from the Bible without first praying, Dear God, speak to me now. And God will do that. He has ways of communicating to us. I've so often heard from people who say, well, I pray and God doesn't say anything. 
And they talk as if God can't communicate with people. If there's one thing God can do, it's he can communicate with people. Let me give you something from Job. It says he never takes his eyes off the righteous. Now that can be scary or comforting depending on where you're at spiritually. He never takes his Then it goes on to say, he establishes them forever, and they are exalted. And then comes an if. If they be bound in fetters, and held in cords of affliction, what then? Then he shows them their work, and their transgressions that they have exceeded, and he opens their ear to discipline, and he commands that they return from iniquity. He's a faithful God. And sometimes we're bound. Remember Simon the sorcerer? And uh, he professed to be saved. Probably he was. He was baptized. Then he offered money to the apostles if he could have the power to lay hands on people so they could receive the Holy Ghost. And Peter gave him a hard time, Remember? He said, I perceive that you're in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. He had that if problem. What was the problem? He was very bitter because until Philip showed up, he was the big shot in the community. Now that was all gone. Nobody was listening to him anymore. Nobody was watching his occult magic stuff, you know. And he was bitter about that. And then he hadn't broken clearly with the occult. I don't think he had. Many people in Samaria were into the occult because we read about Philip and all the people being delivered from demons and this guy was responsible for that. And I don't think he'd bro broken with it completely. And so if, that's us, if they be bound in fetters. We used to sing a lot in revival days Jesus sets me absolutely free. We were singing that in a church in Ontario, and a lady got up and just rushed out of the room. And we thought she wasn't feeling well, but we, she told us later on in her testimony, as we sang the song, she saw how bound up she was. And she had to get into a room somewhere alone with God and get her life straightened up, you know. Jesus sets me absolutely free. He died on Calvary. I forget their other words. It's a beautiful song. But sometimes we Christians, if the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free what? Indeed. Indeed. <coughs> and many of us are not. We can't talk about Jesus. Why is it when two Christians are talking about the Lord, if a sinner happens to sail by, we, we lower our voices so he doesn't hear we talk about something religious, you know? Why do we do that? A little lady, an Anglican lady to Christ in Borough, Manitoba years ago, she had been raised as a girl in Wales. She was there at the time of the Welsh Revival. <clears throat> and she told me what had happened. She said, sometimes you'll be walking down the street and there will be six men kneeling on the sidewalk praying with their arms around each other. And she said, I'd run by. I didn't know what they were doing. She was an Anglican. And she said, but I knew they had something I didn't have. And she said, can you tell me what it is? And I led her to Christ. Those men kneeling on the sidewalk didn't know that little girl running past so fast would be saved and camped at the car they were kneeling there praying, you know. They weren't ashamed to kneel on the sidewalk and pray. A bunch of us flew from the revival in Saskatoon to Toronto by invitation. And when we flew from Saskatoon to Winnipeg, we were all sitting in a little group together on the plane. And then we, as we talked about it, Winnipeg, we had to wait a couple of hours. This isn't right. We should be scattered all over the plane so we could witness the people. So that's what we did. We had a prayer meeting there. We were talking there. All the praying people walking by, one what in the world is going, all these fanatics, you know. Anyway, we got on the plane, and here's what we pray. Dear God, get us next to someone we can share with. When we compared notes afterwards, it was incredible. 
I found myself sitting next to a guy that ran a sawmill. Well, I preached in logging camps for years, you know. I used to work in those camps. I grew, and one of the gals that was in the team, she, she was a nurse and found herself sitting next to a nurse, you know. And this is what happened. God got us all in the right place, you know. Mm -hmm. We had a great time. We got to Toronto and then we had a prayer meeting after we got there. <coughs> we had a great time. Dear people, that's revival. That's what God wants to do here. And we have to we have to learn how to give God quality time. And all of us need to do that. I would never preach myself, I'll just say this. Many years ago, after the revival of Saskatoon, I asked God to waken me every night. I'd often waken nights before, but it was a little spot and sporadic perhaps, but since that time, there's never a night that God doesn't waken me. One o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock, twelve, thirty, whenever, you know. I just get up, and you know what? The telephone never rings at two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know, lots of time just to be alone. You don't have to talk, you can just listen, you know. Tell the Lord you love him. Thank the Lord for who he is, for what he's done. Pick up the Bible, maybe, and read a little, or quote some verses, or sing a song, mm. or just be a friend to God. You know. He made us mm. so we could be that. How disappointed he must be often with us, as his children, as we tear around, you know, like ants in an anthill, running around doing stuff, you know, but not giving God quality time. Well, we know about it. It says, God is faithful by whom you were called. You were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ. You were called to have fellowship with God. 1 John 1, 3, That which we have seen and heard we declare unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Somebody said, and I think this statement is true, that the average Christian does not have fellowship with God. He has fellowship with other Christians above God. And I think it's often that way. Fellowship with God. During those days of revival, we often saw people. I remember a fellow, he was a pastor, and he was having a hard time, and he got very bitter, and the church finally had asked him to go, and he was, oh, he was so bitter. He phoned me, and he told me I could have his library, and he was, he was just almost, almost cursing. He was so angry. Then he heard about the revival in Saskatoon. And he, ma he made up his mind. He was going to go there and blow this revival thing right out the window, you know. <laughs> you know what happened? He walked through the door of the church, and Jesus met him. He ran down to find a room somewhere and he found his face before God and prayed his way back to God. I don't know what happened. He just said, Jesus met him. And we had all kinds of experiences of that kind. Of Jesus meeting people and talking. I remember a fellow one time, he came running back into the church. He started for home after the meeting. He came back in the church and he said, People, I can't, I can't coordinate to drive the car. Well, I tried to drive the car. Can't Jesus is there. The place is filled with the glory of God. I need help to get home. So, I mean, God was so alive, you know, then. And somehow we've lost that to some extent. We need to have it back again. Finney is to say, whenever the revival abated in power, I fasted and prayed, got us to fast and pray, and the revival will come back to the power it had before. We've forgotten that, or didn't know it. And so when the revival abates and we're quite satisfied, well, it has to run its course and that's all over now. It shouldn't really be all over now, I don't think. It's a way of life. Repentance is a way of life, not an act. And uh, so, call to the fellowship of Christ and of God. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. We should pray that sometimes in our times alone with God. Speak to me, Lord. I remember I had a, a couple in Saskatoon from my church. 
And they told me, they said, now, if you're holding a crusade and you need some help, let us know. I'll, I'll take my holidays and we'll come down and we'll help you. you know? And I remember one time, I often had them on the platform, had them give their testimony. And he always sit there smiling. And he said, I guess you notice I'm always smiling sitting on the platform. And he asked him, sir, what's going on? He said, well, I know what's going to happen down there and the people don't know. He knew what God was going to do. And Howard Gardner, who worked with me, Howard was such a, so in contact with God. He was, he looked so much like the Lord and we fellowship together with some, just some great times. But he knew when God began to work in the congregation, he knew in what corner of the congregation God began to work. I never ever had a clue. God never gave me that kind of insight. He had this kind of insight. I remember once we were staying in a house in Texas. They gave us a house to stay and nobody else was around and he had a room and I had a room and we had a kitchen there and stuff. And One afternoon I, I knew he was praying. I could hear him praying. And then the Lord just told me to go in. So I went in and he was struggling with, I don't know what it was, he was he had a hold of God and he was afraid he was going to die. And we had to pray through uh, at that time. It wasn't a satanic thing. It was just he'd gotten so close to God. And I think the Lord was about to take him home. He's, he's home with the Lord now, by the way. But he had such an insight into the things of God. The hours he spent alone with God and hours we spent together in the presence of God. So you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. And he's commanded us to pray, right? Mm -hmm. Many times. Mm -hmm. 400 prayers in the Bible, 500 short prayers in the Psalms alone, 1,400 references to prayer in the Bible <coughs> altogether. And God is looking. Remember that verse, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of those whose heart is perfect towards him. Which is to say God is looking for people through whom he can pour himself, through whom he can speak. You know, I'm not sure who it was said this. It might have been Spurgeon, but a preacher said this if I have an hour to prepare a message I spend the hour in prayer and I get a message in Toronto one time at a conference one of the men came to me one morning and said well Bill let's go I said let's go where he said you're speaking at the Ontario Bible College in about 35 minutes I said why didn't somebody tell me he said, I wrote you about this months ago. When I got home, I checked my correspondence, and it handwritten eight pages, and I hadn't read it all because it was hard reading, you know? I hadn't read it all. So now I'm in a car, and for 30 minutes, I'm going to speak to a bunch of kids at the Bible college, you know? So what do you do? Do you panic? No. Didn't God know all about this? Sure, God knew how stupid I was, you know? He knew all about that. No problem. So I just started praising the Lord. <laughs> Give me a text. That's all I need is a text. John 7, 38 and 9. Amen. I had the whole thing by the time I got there. Amen. When I got there, the dean said, Now, Bill, don't take any more than about 28 minutes. We, you know, we have a busy schedule here. And it's just, uh, so I preached for 26 minutes. I watched it carefully. I prayed for two minutes afterwards, and I sat down. And God took over. And all of the, all those kids and staff were falling on their knees, crying. It was just a beautiful thing. Mm. I couldn't believe it. I saw what was happening there. People crying before God. Everybody on their face before God. And the dean came running up and he said, Oh, Bill, we don't need 28 minutes. He said, We need a whole week of this. And I couldn't say, as it turned out. But God wants to do this kind of thing. Mm if we'd let him but we have to spend time alone with God and get our messages from God not from some book you know. today one of our big problems is we spend hours listening to tapes and hours reading books and very little time with the word of God and very little time in the presence of God 
a friend of God. Will you be there? Will you be there, a friend of God?